get it. I'm filled with your spirit. I, I praise you. I've got the knowledge. But something is terribly wrong. I can't take care of my family. I'm lean, I've got liens. I've got lawyers suing me. I need help. Welcome. We are so glad that you have chosen to join us today. We pray that you are blessed by the music and the ministry of the service you are about to participate in. We are so glad that you have chosen to be here and we pray that you are blessed. Now, if this is your first time, we ask that you let us know where you're watching from because we have people in so many different countries. And if this message touches you, if there's something that blesses you, please leave a comment, give us a thumbs up, a heart. We just love it when you show your praise for what God is ministering to you. It's not for us, this is all about Him. So we want you to be a participant, not just an observer in this service with us today. And if there's some way that you need to contact us, if you have a question, if you need prayer, if you need a Bible, our information will be at the end of the video where you can reach out to us, you can call us, you can message us through Facebook. There's so many different ways, but mainly you can visit our central hub at GodspeedMinistry.com and all of the information is there. And if you want to continue your worship through giving, which is always goes to God, then we invite you to do that also through our central hub, GodspeedMinistry.com. Now, let's get into why you came into the message. Okay, we'll be reading the scripture today from Matthew chapter 6. <clears throat> it's in the New Testament in your pew Bibles on page 6. Uh, starting with verse 25 and going to the end of the chapter. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor about your body, what you shall put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value, of more value than they are? And which of you, by being anxious, can add one cubit to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not more, <coughs> will he not much more clothe you? O man of little faith, Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be yours as well. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Let the day's own trouble be sufficient for the day. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Gary. Jesus spoke about the kingdom of God in 10 different parables just in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus used 55 parables in his teachings throughout his time here on this earth. He used parables because everyone likes a good story. He used parables to con use everyday things such as birds and barns and lilies as Gary just read about. He uses the everyday thing to teach us about an eternal spiritual thing. So when I ask you what is a kingdom, What are your thoughts? Do you see a king or a monarch with maybe a crown and a big throne? 
Do you think of a country or a government? The word kingdom can also be government. Do you know that when Jesus used the word church, he was using a governmental word. And we, I've lost my sheet now, uh, but he used that word and he talked about the church as his governing body here on this earth. Have you thought about that? We, we have, in my mind, and in so many people I speak with, we've made church a religious thing rather than a governmental thing. Well, Renee, there's got to be separation of church and state. No. Do you know that the Constitution of the United States is based upon the model that God gave Israel for government? Do you know that it wasn't until the 1940s or 50s that the term separation of church and state came into being? And it isn't a rule or a regulation. But it's something we've been taught over and over. You have to have separation of church and state. What was intended in the letter that the president who's words were missed, taken out of context and used against the church. He said that the state is never to override the church, which is an affirmation of what was stated by Benjamin Franklin and most of the declaration, the signers of the Declaration of Independence. They knew, and it even stated, that if there ever came a time when the state, the government of this country overrode the rule and reign of God through the church in this country, it would be right where we are right today. They saw it, that if they ever let the kingdom of God be overtaken by the kingdom of man, that this is what would happen because it's what happens anytime the kingdom of God is pushed out for the kingdom of man. Now Gary read the scripture to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, the things of food, shelter, clothing, and long life would be added to you when you seek first the kingdom. But I am pretty sure based on my time in this congregation and time in life in general, most of us spend more time at work than we do in church. Most of us spend more time pursuing the very things God says he would give you if we pursued the kingdom first. But there's not many things or sermons preached on what the kingdom of God truly is. And that's what Jesus was trying to convey to us in these parables. Gary Cassi, pastor of Faith Life Now up in New Albany, Ohio, was a worship leader. He had been to Rayma Bible School, I think it was Rayma, out in Oklahoma. He and his wife were born again, filled with faith, Christians. And yet, for nine years, they lived hand to mouth. They lived in an old 1800 farmhouse where the weeds were growing from the outside into the inside. He tells the story that his children, I think they had five, they would get the children's mattresses in the dump and the dumpster behind the nursing homes. Their carpet was found alongside the road. They had maxed out every single credit card. Their fridge was empty. They had borrowed thousands of dollars from his family and her family, and they were ashamed to show up. But yet, they'd show up to church on Sunday and praise God worship God and tell people about God, but yet their lives were not an example of the kingdom. And he said, I was finally to the point, I was 
so stressed out that I was actually to the point of paralysis. And he said, I fell across the bed knowing that I had nowhere else to turn. And I said, God, you've got to help me. I think probably most of us have prayed those prayers before as well. So he, he falls across the bed begging God to help him. And he said, God, I don't get it. I'm filled with your spirit. I, I praise you. I've got the knowledge. But something is terribly wrong. I can't take care of my family. I'm lean, I've got liens. I've got lawyers suing me. I need help. Thank goodness I don't think many of us have been in that situation. I hope not. But thankfully, if you have been, you've, you've been brought through. But he says, as I was laying there, I heard the voice of God say, Learn my kingdom. Learn my kingdom. You don't know the rules of my kingdom. Now, I just told you that a kingdom is a government. And many of us think that we can't know the kingdom of God, but yet Jesus told his disciples that everything I have, I give to you. I give you all of my knowledge. Now, yes, God's thoughts are way beyond ours, but Jesus came to demonstrate to us the Father and the kingdom. Now, a kingdom has rules and regulations. North Carolina has rules and regulations. We have driving rules. We have rules of, of different things. Most of our rules for society up until the last 60, 70, 80 years were based upon the Ten Commandments. Although there are some obscure ones out there about not bringing your cow in the house. Now, why would someone make a rule like that? It is really interesting to go back through and find some of those rules. But anyway, the rules are supposed to be set, and that's what they did with the Constitution. Now, we make amendments as we need to adjust for the time. But God says, I am the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The same rules that Jesus lived by on this <coughs> planet and the things he did are the same rules available to you and to me. But if we don't know what those rules are, we can't change. So when Gary could see, heard God say, you don't know my rules, you don't know the laws of my kingdom, Gary said, well, I'm not the brightest book in the library, maybe, or the student in the class. <clears throat> he said, but I can learn rules. I was good at following rules. Do this, don't do that. He said, so I set out <clears throat> to learn about how the kingdom of God works. Because a law works the same every single time. And God tells me that he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So if I learn what has to happen, what is legal in the kingdom of God, what is not legal in the kingdom of God, then I can change my life. In three years, Gary shares his story just about every time I've heard him speak. In three years, they had paid off all of their debt. They had bought a new home. They had bought a new car. Cash, not going into debt. He said, when I began to walk with God, to seek the kingdom of heaven, to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all of my life changed. And he said, I've never looked back, but I've made it my mission to set God's people free. Because no one teaches us how the kingdom of God works. And I don't have the time to do all of that today. But I want to give you a foundation and strike your interest in how the kingdom of God works. It's part of what we're doing on Monday nights with the Ten Commandments. Because that's the foundation of God's kingdom. It's the first time scripture has ever been written. But if you want good homework for this week, read Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. There's 10 parables in there that teach you about the kingdom of God. Number one is going to teach you that our words are seed. And just like you scatter seed 
in the garden, or yesterday we put out grass seed, hoping for new grass. You've got to put out the seed, and the type of seed you put out is going to be the type of harvest you get. But everything in the kingdom not only works by word, but it also works by faith. It is impossible to please God without faith. You have to believe. Well, how do you believe? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So you have to get to the point where you take the word of God, which is also seed, and that when we speak the word of God and we, we put it in our heart, like it says in the parable, that when we put the word down deep in our heart, we sleep, we eat, we go about our daily work. And by the way, God just reminded me, work and worship are the same word. So now you don't have to feel guilty about working more than you're in church, as long as your work is under God. All right? Work and worship in Hebrew are the same root. They mean the same. So we worship God by what we do. And I'm going to share a story here in just a moment. So you put the word of God in you. you it goes down into you. You hide that word. You don't see it. And then all of a sudden, you keep putting, watering that word. With the, the word is also the, the word of God. But also we water with the word. His word is, can be many different things. So we keep watering that word until one day it pops up in your mind and you know that you know that you know that you have that thing. So you see it come up out of the ground just like a seed would come up out of the ground. And it doesn't look like the seed you put in the dirt, does it? So you have to wait while that kernel of corn shoots up out of the ground and now this is something green and you put a yellow or a red or a white kernel in the ground. But you have to wait and watch it grow and be patient because it's not ready for harvest yet. But boy, don't we look forward to that good, sweet corn come July and to pick it and roast it or put butter on it and eat it or cut it off and make cream corn or just corn off the cob. We look forward to that. You know when it's right in the same way as with the kingdom of God. You have to put word in. It may not be immediate. It takes time. And God tells us that as well. We have to, Joyce Meyer says, we have to work the word. We have to keep putting the word in us. And when we are fully convinced, as it says in Hebrew, now faith is the substance. Some of that says the type of need. Some of it says being fully persuaded. How many of you tested those pews before you sat down this morning? Nobody? Not one person tested that pew before you sat down? You just assumed it was going to hold you up. Or was it by faith? See, we have assumption, but it's based on experience. And you see, the more we see God work, just as we shared the story of Barbara crying, oh God, please no, don't let me fall, and he catches her and lays her down. When we get experience with God in that way, then we begin to have more faith, stronger faith. Our faith, there, you can pray in, with faith, but then Paul says that you can pray with your most holy faith. Did you know there are degrees of faith? Mm -hmm. So as we, just like a child that's learning to walk, it may take longer. But the more proficient we get in reading and believing the word, putting it over and over and over. The Jewish people say that you should read the word of God a hundred times before you expect to know and have faith in it. A hundred times. Oh, I don't have that much time. I'm too impatient. Patience is not my strong suit. Do you know that patience is one of the gifts of the Spirit? Fruit, aren't gifts? Fruit of the Spirit. Apples, pears, strawberries, blueberries, whatever, they all develop through the process just like the Word. So our faith is developed over time. <clears throat> I want to share this story with you from... Uh, T. Freeman. 
He says Israel, for all of its history, has been living proof to the world that there is an Almighty God that cares about his world and is directly involved in everything that happens down here. There is justice, there is meaning, there is purpose. Life is not a joke. And every human being has an open door to the penthouse of the cosmos. I never heard it put that way. Every living being has an open door to the cosmos of, or to the penthouse of the cosmos. It's all about to repair and establish the world under the dominion or kingdom of Almighty God. To bring light where there is darkness, truth into places infested by lies, kindness in the face of terror, and healing to a broken world. Jesus told us that you overcome evil with good. He's stating the same thing here. Every obedience to God repairs the world in some way, touching it at some crucial nodule point and manipulating it back into shape, creating harmony and unity in higher realms, lower realms, wherever it is out of whack. Until when every vertebrae of the cosmos is back in place, every lost spark returned to its place, then we will awaken to a wholesome, healthy world as it was originally meant to be. He wants to see this world being healed. He wants to see it with an, in, with an infinite will, and he puts his entire being, the core of all that he is, into every act of healing, restoration that we do. Meaning that when you pray to God, he puts aside all the symphonic harmony of the angels to bend down and listen to what's bothering his little creature down here. Let me read that again. He puts aside all the symphonic harmony of the angels, the worship of the angels in all of his beauty. Bill, you, you did well on that um, bells, rainbow's golden bells, but I don't think you compare with the angels. But I know that God stopped to listen to you. So he, he bends down to listen to what's bothering this little creature down here. You and me. Why? Because he decided that this act of healing, he will derive pleasure. When you speak words of the Bible and explain it in your own words, he squeezes himself tightly into every breath that leaves your mouth. When you wrap, drop, or when you drop those coins into the offering box, speak out against injustice, help the widow or the orphan, or place a dollar bill in the hand of a homeless guy standing there on the traffic island, he is there, all of him, talking about God, in that small act of yours. He decided in his free will, do these acts that will heal my world, and I in these, and in these I will take the deepest pleasure, and so I will be there with you. And that's an excerpt from his book, What's in It for God by T. Freeman. Imagine God taking pleasure in the work that we do. No wonder it's called worship. But you see, the kingdom has these guidelines and these rules. And I always tell people, well, I don't know what God's will is. When they ask me, I tell them, will it be in heaven? Will there be sickness in heaven? No. Will there be anger or tears in heaven? No. So all of those things, if it's an injustice, if it's unrighteousness, if it's something that will not be in heaven, you and I are to allow or disallow, arrest anything caught down here that is not of heaven. You see, when you and I came to faith in Jesus Christ, we immediately got citizenship in heaven. We have dual citizenship. Well, Renee, I'm not dead yet. No, but the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is within you. It is in your mouth. And we have the right to say that's not legal by God. And you have the right not only to say that's not legal, but also to decree what is legal. 
I used to pray for God to heal me. And I would ask God to take away the sickness. And he said, if I take away the sickness, but you haven't asked me to put in the good, then you're going to go seven times deeper the other way. I never knew that. That's exactly what he says. So when we pray for something to be removed, we should also ask for that to be filled with goodness, with healing, with divine healing, where we thrive. Not just feel better, but where we have his divine healing and health that then can permeate through the rest of our bodies. There are keys to the kingdom. The kingdom is the word of God, and especially in those 10 parables in the book of Matthew, where God teaches and transforms us. Gary Cassi talks about it over and over. He travels the world now teaching the kingdom of God, the rules of God, and when we align ourselves with the word of God, we get the results of the kingdom. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. You thank you that you have given us a way and a place to align ourselves with you. We thank you, Father, that you have given us the word. And Father, that when we, as Joyce Meyer says, work the word, it will work in us and it will work for us. Lord, we are not trying to manipulate. We are trying to learn and align and bring ourselves into submission and obedience with your will your ways so that we will represent you in this world and people will know, like Israel, that there is a God. That's what we want in this community, Father. We want to bring this church and ourselves into perfect alignment, demonstrating the rules and regulations of your kingdom, the authority, the peace, the joy, and the righteousness. Those are the three things of your kingdom. That's all. Peace, joy, and righteousness. And that's what we want in our lives. We just speak that now, Father, through the name and the power and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. We pray you were blessed by today's message. We have some amazing people who are willing to go to the four corners of this nation to tell you about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if something in the message today, in the service, of the music or whatever you saw or heard touched you and you want to reach out to us please do so our information will be here you can reach out to the ministry at 704-473-4212 or you can get all of our information at godspeedministry.com we want you to know god personally powerfully and passionately because we are preparing to become his bride when he returns for us or when we leave this earth. So we want to make sure that you have that relationship with him. That's our main priority. It's not just to give you a head knowledge, but a heart knowledge to be adopted by the King of the universe and the Lord of Lords and to have all your sins washed away so that you walk in victory in this world. Godspeed Ministry exists to connect people to God and then to each other in service to bring other people who are hurting, lost, worried, confused, and afraid into the saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if that's you, make sure that you reach out to us. You can reach out to us in the comments, in the messenger, and again at GodFeedMinistry.com. We look forward to hearing from you. And if this message was a blessing to you and you are already walking with God and this just fired you up to walk even closer with it, leave us a heart and let us know. And we'll see you in heaven. Godspeed. Thank you.